Huntley was born in Grimsby in Lincolnshire on the 31st of January 1974. He had a turbulent time at school and was often the target of bullying. So I think this created a, a bit of a sense of shame in Ian Huntley, something that is often at the root of a lot of men like him in terms of what they go on to do. So he started off as, as somebody who was always the kid that was a bit odd, the, the odd one out, the, the one who's a bit of a loner. In December 1994, Huntley met 18-year-old Claire Evans. They had a whirlwind romance and were married within weeks. His wife, Claire, quickly found that he had a terrible temper. She later claimed that uh, she feared for her life and that he would often put his hands round her neck. Ian Huntley is somebody who is not capable of having a, a normal relationship with a woman. So he, he moves very quickly because he wants to maintain a sense of control within his relationships. So he will breeze into women's lives, this knight in shining armour full of, of charm and compliments and, and will kind of try and wind them in. Huntley's marriage didn't last long. His wife Claire had started a relationship with his younger brother Wayne. Despite the marriage being all but over, Huntley refused to grant her a divorce until 1999 to prevent their relationship from becoming official. He'd always felt incredibly threatened by his younger brother. He took the attention away from him when he, he came into that family. And because of Ian Huntley's narcissistic tendencies, he's always going to feel he's being outdone by, by his brother. While still married to Claire, Huntley fathered a daughter with a 15-year-old girl in 1998. I think it will be fair to say that Huntley demonstrated throughout his adolescence and early manhood that he had an unhealthy appetite in younger and younger women. Well, during his 20s, Ian Huntley preyed on a lot of young girls, underage girls, and, and the police who investigated the case thought that there were possibly up to 60 young girls that he'd had some kind of interaction with on, on that level and he would kind of worm his way into to these girls' lives. And they're younger, they're, they're more impressionable, they're easier to, to lure in. In 1998, 24-year-old Huntley appeared at Grimsby Crown Court, charged with both burglary and the rape of an 18-year-old girl. Both cases were dropped due to lack of evidence, but he was gaining a bad reputation across Lincolnshire. He was uh, insignificant little man who, uh, on the surface, wouldn't say boo to a goose. Unfortunately, he had no conscience and would do whatever he wanted when he wanted to do it. In February 1999, Huntley met 22-year-old Maxine Carr, and after dating for just four weeks, they moved in together. She was naive, impressionable, and he was a uh, an interesting figure to her, I think. She found him perhaps, I would hesitate to call him charismatic, but at least interesting, and did not discover the violent side to his nature that his wife had. Maxine Carr was a very easy target, in a way, for Ian Huntley, because um, at this point in his life, um, he's managed to hone those skills of hooking women in, being quite superficially charming and manipulative and saying the things that they wanted to hear. So he's got quite a well-rehearsed script at this point in time. On the 15th of August, 11 days after the girls went missing, Sky News decided to retrace their steps, which meant interviewing the last person to see them, local school caretaker Ian Huntley, the boyfriend of Holly and Jessica's classroom assistant, Maxine Carr. It's 6.15 p.m. The timeline on that Sunday night, the 4th of August, puts the girls here, right in the forecourt of the village college, the local education centre. We know they'd been to the sports centre just across the road a few minutes before to buy some sweets and were carrying on walking through what would have been very familiar territory. Their primary school, St Andrews, is just the across the back of the village college here. How do we know they were here at 6.15? Well, we have an eyewitness. Ian Huntley here is a familiar figure. Evening, Ian. You're the school caretaker. The girls 
Jessica and Holly would know you, and they saw you on the front doorstep. What what went on? Well, the girl, the, I don't know the girls. Um, I was still on the front doorstep grooming my dog down. She'd run away and come back a bit of a mess. Um, they just came across and asked how Miss Carr was, as she used to teach them at St Andrews. Um, I just said she weren't very good, as she hadn't got the job. And they just says, please tell her that we're very sorry. And uh, off the walk in the direction of the, um, the library over there. And you may, as it turned out, have been the last person to actually chat to them before they vanished. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Huntley looked like an unassuming, ordinary little bloke with a soft voice who wouldn't hurt a fly. He was a slight withdrawn sort of character, but at the time he seemed reasonably credible. It seemed like a credible story. That's where the girls would have walked. So when I talked to him, I had an open mind. I certainly at the time wasn't thinking, this is the guy that's done them harm. Maxine Carr was also keen to appear on camera. We interviewed her in the middle of the village and got her to tell us about her relationship with the girls. They're ever so funny, they're brilliant, they're kind to everybody. Um, they wouldn't say a bad word about anybody. And they love their families and everything, which is why nobody believes that they would ever run away. Um, they was very close to all their family. This is something I'll probably keep for the rest of my life, I think. It's what Holly gave me on the last day of term. She was very upset, and that's the kind of girl she was. She was just lovely, really lovely. In the conversation, we realised a few minutes afterwards she spoke about the girls in the past tense. When I was talking to her live, didn't really occur to me, but a couple of minutes afterwards, we said thanks very much, and she walked off, and uh, my producer said, just play that tape again. I'm sure she was talking about the girls in the past tense. Often, the perpetrator is among the searchers, not without exception, but often because they want to admire their own handiwork. Could it be the person responsible for Holly and Jessica's disappearance had been under the noses of detectives from day one? On the 16th of August, 2002, 12 days after the disappearance of 10-year-old schoolgirls Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, Local caretaker Ian Huntley and his girlfriend Maxine Carr had been taken in for questioning by police. Interviews given by the pair on Sky News had roused the suspicions of detectives. We were starting to think, wow, these two people really could be involved in something to do with these girls. They're close enough to it. They've clearly aroused police suspicion at this stage. But after just seven hours, they were released when Carr provided Huntley with an alibi. She claimed she was with him in their home on the night of the girl's disappearance. It wasn't until about 10 or 11 at night that we heard that police released them, which we found interesting. And I got a phone number from Maxine Carr. I thought, well, worth a gamble, I'll just ring and see if I get through to them. And extraordinarily enough, I did. I got straight through to Maxine Khan. And I said, I gather you've been interviewed by the police. What happened? How are you? She said, well, we're fine. Um, I can't tell you anything about it, but it's all all right. Huntley then grabbed the phone off her and I guess wanted to end the conversation quickly. So he said, well, thanks for ringing. Uh, yeah, we're fine, nothing, nothing to report. Um, the police have let us go, nothing going on. Thanks a lot, thanks for ringing, bye. Once Huntley and Carr had been questioned, further searches were carried out at their home and at Huntley's place of work, Soham Village College. It was quite clear as we checked back that something had happened on the Friday night during the interviews with Huntley and Carr, it had triggered further searches. And because they suddenly saw Huntley as perhaps the key figure here, they went back over his territory, his home and his workplace. And it was then that they began to find evidence that he had abducted the girls. On the 17th of August, investigators got their biggest breakthrough in the case yet. In the bins at the school where Huntley worked, they found the burnt remains of two football shirts, tracksuit bottoms, shoes and some underwear. Forensic expert Peter Lamb identified the clothes as those belonging to Holly and Jessica. 
One of the crucial items in this particular case was the tops that the little girls were last seen in. These were unusual, and this helped us tremendously to build up a picture of the types of fibres that it would be easy for us to find. Whenever two human beings interact, there is an exchange of material, be that something as tiny as DNA up to something less subtle like a, a fibre, up to saliva or bodily fluids, blood. We leave a mark on each other and no matter how hard one tries to destroy all of that evidence, there will usually be something left to say that two people have been interacting. There is this constant interaction of material that allows forensic scientists to draw conclusions and ultimately to come up with very strong evidence that places one person in one place with another person and builds the case. Forensic scientist Peter Lamb had the girls' clothes, but now he had to link them forensically to Ian Huntley. And it didn't take long. During the examination of the items from the bin, um, I found five human head hairs. These head hairs were compared with Holly's hair and Jessica's hair. They didn't match either of those two, but they did match Ian Huntley's hair. This vital evidence led to the arrest of both Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr on the very same day, the 17th of August, on suspicion of abduction and murder. Nurse Beverly Allitt's job was to protect the children in her care, but she abused her role. She was purposely harming them. Her crimes were horrific and ruined the lives of many, including the families of her innocent victims. As a judge said to take her down, there were emotional scenes in the public gallery with families bursting into tears. One woman jumped up shouting, bastard, bastard. Another shouted, lock her in a cage. Beverly Allitt had tried to get away with murder. Her story begins over two decades earlier. Beverly Allitt was born on the 4th of October 1968 in the small Lincolnshire village of Corby Glen. She was one of four children. There don't seem to be any real red flags in, in Beverly Allitt's background that, that would suggest that she'd go on to do the things she did. So normally when we, we have a serial killer, we have an abusive or a violent childhood. There's something that's there in the background, but with Beverly Allitt, there doesn't seem to be any real powerful explanatory factor. Fast forward to April 1991, 22-year-old Beverly Allitt had been working on the children's ward at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital for three months. One of the consultants on Ward 4 was Dr. Charith Naniyakara. My first impressions about Beverly Allitt was nothing outstanding. She was just another quiet, pleasant, obliging nurse who was available. During Alit's short time on the ward, three children had died suddenly, and a further nine had fallen seriously ill under suspicious circumstances. On April the 22nd, 1991, Beverly Alit was on duty when 15-month-old Claire Peck was admitted to Ward 4. She was under the care of the two consultants at the hospital, Dr. Frederick Porter and Dr. Nana Yakara. Claire Peck, she had come with a severe attack of asthma, breathing difficulties, requiring oxygen. So Dr. Porter was called and he had come. He had tried to resuscitate and provide all the necessary care as appropriate. And Beverly Allett on this occasion had been with him. In spite of all the efforts taken, Dr. Porter couldn't resuscitate her and she had died within hours. Claire Peck was the fourth child to die unexpectedly at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in three months. It was an alarming number in such a short space of time. I said, I really don't know what's going on. And got together with Dr. Porter and a senior nursing manager and checked through all the cases of worrying suspicions and anxieties we had. I compiled a report 
and sent it to unit general manager saying we have series of these unexplained and sometimes explained collapses we are very worried about these problems and therefore we want to bring it to your notice we need your help on the 30th of April, the hospital decided to ask the police to investigate the deaths to see if there could be something or someone casting a shadow over Ward 4. Just five days later, on March the 10th, 14-month-old Kaylee Desmond was on Ward 4 suffering with a chest infection. After being left alone with Alit for some one-to-one -one nursing, Kaylee had an unexpected heart attack. Beverly Allett was seen in the room and actually called other nurses to go and have a look, which was one of her common things. She would call other nurses to say, come and have a look at this child, and then the crash team would be called. Kaylee survived the collapse and was transferred to another hospital. Due to the massive toll the arrest put on her young body, she was left brain damaged. Detectives investigating the unusual pattern of patient collapses on Ward 4 found a clue in Kaylee's x-rays. We were able to show that there was needle tracking under the arm of this little girl and, and, and an air bubble which had obviously um, caused the equivalent of what we would call a heart attack. This mysterious needle mark was further proof to detectives they were dealing with a killer they'd already discovered the high insulin count in the blood of Paul Crampton, who survived. They continued their investigations with the cases of two more suspiciously ill children, Bradley Gibson and two-year-old Yik Chan. Bradley Gibson is admitted under Dr. Porter. He was about five or six-year-old and had breathing difficulties. Dr. Porter had treated him with possible chest infection and he then suddenly had stopped breathing and stopped his heartbeat as well what we call a cardiac arrest which is extremely rare. Dr. Porter had tried repeatedly to resuscitate him with the defibrillator. He managed to get him around extremely fortunate. Yik Chan was admitted with a suspected fractured skull. He's in the hospital for a couple of days and he's charging around the place. There's clearly not very much wrong with him. One particular evening, um, Beverly Allett is going off duty and she speaks to the oncoming nurse at about nine o'clock in the evening and said, can you have a look in at, at Chan? He's crying, he's, he's not very well. The oncoming nurse goes into the room and, and finds him with his back arched and blue and the crash team are called and he's resuscitated. Bradley Gibson and Yik Chan both survived unscathed. Three-month-old identical twins, Katie and Becky Phillips, were not so lucky. The pair were born prematurely and were regular visitors to Ward 4. In early April 1991, they were back and being treated by Dr. Nana Yukana. They had repeated admissions, not surprisingly again, with a variety of illnesses, diarrhea, vomiting, breathing difficulties, and so on and so forth. And the parents, quite rightly, were very worried and brought them straight to the hospital rather than going to the GP. I had seen them and discharged them, reassured the parents. But the same night, Becky was brought to the casualty. The casualty staff taking lots of effort to resuscitate her, but she was virtually dead. So I had a long discussion with the parents. They were completely shocked and they were very, very upset. I left some blood samples in the laboratory for any future investigations if needed. And we subsequently found uh, that, that blood and had it analysed and that contained 9,660 milliunits per litre of, of insulin in the blood. And you always have to remember with these huge figures that a child should have 15 to 20 milliunits. So it, it's horrendous. Later on that same day, April the 5th, Dr Nana Yakara asked Becky's parents to bring her twin sister Katie in as a precaution. Katie's taken into hospital and that afternoon she's allocated to the care of Beverly Allett. 
one of the senior nurses goes to that particular room to see what's going on. Something very sinister was happening on Ward 4 at Grantham and Castephen Hospital. Between the deaths of Becky Phillips on the 5th of April and Claire Peck on April the 22nd, four more boys had been admitted with minor symptoms and unexpectedly came close to death. That made a total of 13 suspicious incidents, four deaths and nine close calls. But now investigators had the arduous task of making a list of suspects. One of the names on that list was a woman who always seemed to be on duty whenever something went wrong. 22-year-old staff nurse, Beverly Allen. In May 1991, police were investigating a spate of mysterious deaths and illnesses on the children's ward at Grantham and Castephen Hospital in Lincolnshire. After digging deeper into the individual cases, they were certain they were chasing a serial killer. There's clear evidence of air injected under the arm of one child. There's evidence of squeeze injuries. There's evidence of um, insulin. What was a common factor with the vast majority of these children was that each of them had a cannula fitted, a, a site, um, usually in the back of the hand, where drugs or drips can be administered through. So injecting cardiotoxic drugs would not be, would not be very difficult because it could go in through the IV port. This is quite a common method for, firstly, a female serial killer and a healthcare serial killer. Poison is a very common method used by these people. It's accessible. It's something that, that is not going to immediately cause concern because this is something that's already in that hospital environment anyway. And also, poisoning is quite a, quite a remote method of killing somebody. You're not up close and personal with them. It's not messy. You can administer the poison and then, then leave the scene. You don't have to see them uh, suffer the effects of it. Chief Superintendent Stuart Clifton and his team interviewed all the staff members on Ward 4 and a new piece of evidence emerged that suddenly became crucial. I began to look at the circumstances of insulin in Grantham Hospital and I found that it was kept in locked fridges on, on the wards. And on the children's ward, the key to the fridge had gone missing three days before the first child had collapsed. Beverly Allett was the last known person to have that key, but no hospital investigation had actually taken place. Beverly Allett's name kept cropping up she always seemed to be at the hospital when the incidents occurred, and the staff duty rota confirmed this. What we discovered was that for every collapse, Beverly Allett was the only nurse that was on duty on every occasion. And on many of these occasions, we could actually put her right at the bedside, either at the time of the collapse or just before. On the 21st of May 1991, Stuart Clifton made the brave decision of having Beverly Allett arrested. I basically couldn't take the chance that if she was still working on there, she would harm more children. John Wayne Gacy was born in Chicago, Illinois, on the 17th of March 1942. The second of three children, Gacy had a difficult upbringing. His father was an alcoholic who was reportedly both mentally and physically abusive to his children and their mother. His father spent uh, apparently all of Gacy's childhood demeaning him and physically punishing him and telling him how stupid and worthless and effeminate he was. Gacy's childhood friend, Barry Boschelli, remembers the physical abuse he suffered at the hands of his father. If Johnny was two minutes late, no food. So a lot of times Johnny ate at our house and stayed at our house overnight. He used to take Johnny when he was sitting at the kitchen table and he would take his fist and hit Johnny in the face. The father is a very significant figure in the genesis of Gacy's terrible deeds. For to my mind, Gacy was always trying to satisfy his father, whom he never could. He was beaten 
repeatedly by his father with belts, with brooms. At one stage, he was knocked out by him. These people grow up with such a malignant view of the world and of human relationships and feeling that human relationships are not based on love and trust and respect, you know, that they're all based on exploitation and cruelty and inflicting pain. Gacy was a sickly child. He suffered from a heart condition, limiting his involvement in sports activities and consequently alienating him from his peers. Aged 11, an accident in a playground led to his teenage years being blighted by blackouts and hospital visits. At that time, the swings were wooden base swings with heavy chains coming down. Johnny went to grab it and the swing clicked him right across the forehead and knocked him to the ground. By 1966, 24-year-old Gacy was married and had relocated to the city of Waterloo, 300 miles west of Chicago, in the neighboring state of Iowa. Well, Gacy got married and life from the outside appeared to be relatively normal. He had quite a good job. Um, his wife had two children. So they appeared to be the, the, the typical cereal box American nuclear family. And Gacy wasn't just a, a regular family man. He was also quite active in the, the local chamber of commerce and he played quite an active role. And he was a real figure in the local community. Gacy had started to build the perfect life for himself but he was concealing a dark secret. He developed an unhealthy sexual interest in young boys. There was a son of a fellow JC member um, who he, he lured back to his home and he sexually assaulted. So he's, he's abusing power. He's getting into these positions of trust and he's taking advantage. And, and that's a theme that's gonna continue for him. And then when the kid revealed this to his father, and Gacy was arrested for it. Uh, Gacy hired another teenager to intimidate this kid, to lure this kid into some remote place and spray mace in his eyes and beat him up and warn him against testifying in Gacy's case. Despite Gacy's efforts, his victim still testified, but there wasn't conclusive proof of an attack. Therefore, police were only able to charge him with sodomy of the 15-year-old boy. He pleaded guilty to one count of sodomy, thinking he would get uh, a very, very minimal sentence. Uh, but the judge threw the book at him, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. On the 3rd of December, 1968, Gacy was sent to Anamosa State Penitentiary. Gacy actually handcuffs himself and turns around and struggles with the handcuffs, and then turns back and he holds the handcuffs up. and. Peast is pretty amazed at that, and he said, well, that's, that's neat, how'd you do that? So Gacy says, well, here, you handcuff yourself, and I'll show you how to do that. So Peast handcuffs himself, and he struggles, and he struggles, and he struggles, and he looks at Gacy, and he says, now, what's the trick to this? And Gacy reaches in his pocket and pulls out a key to the handcuffs, and he says, the trick is, you gotta have this key. This handcuff trick was part of an horrific yet clinical M.O. Gacy, throughout all of the 33 killings, had developed a method of killing these young kids. He would uh, pick up these victims. Some were kids who worked from him, but most were teenage runaways, you know, and bringing them back to his house and giving them drinks. He would sort of trick them into handcuffing themselves or being handcuffed. Gacy would use chloroform to subdue his victims. Uh, chloroform's a, an old-fashioned anaesthetic, really, so it gets into your lungs and it just renders you unconscious very effectively. He did what he called a rope trick. And when he had these young kids incapacitated like that, he would slip a rope over their neck, a knotted rope like a loop, and then put the stick in the back like a tourniquet and he would slowly turn the tourniquet. And he said he had it perfected so well that he knew exactly how the body would react to each half turn. Putting a ligature around the neck, the first thing it's going to block is the blood vessels, so it prevents blood getting to the brain, prevents it getting back to the body from the brain. It's gonna be very uncomfortable and it can even render you unconscious in a small number of seconds and he went into detail on how he would torture these young men. 
And he, in fact, did double and triple murders. He would incapacitate two or three people at a time and kill one person in front of the other victims and then continue to kill the other victims. And he seemed to be pretty proud of that. But we used that to our advantage to keep him talking, and he described every killing um, to a T, exactly how it happened, all 33. As the news broke across the country, one shocked viewer who'd unknowingly experienced Gacy's M.O. firsthand was his ex-employee, Tony Antonucci. Whilst working for PDM, Tony had accidentally got a nail stuck in his foot. John took me and I got a tetanus shot and, uh, and took me home. And he came over later that evening to check on if I was okay or that was the the theory, but he also had, you know, some wine and we were drinking and he was kind of joking around. It was probably 10, 10 30 at night. I was a high school wrestler and he said, oh, you know, you know, you're a big wrestler guy. And he started wrestling around with me. He got uh, my left arm and he got it behind me and I felt him put a handcuff on it. I kept flailing my right hand around so that he he couldn't get my right arm, but eventually he did get a hold of my right arm and he knocked me down to the floor with my hands behind me. He left the room for a few minutes and I realized that if I pulled really hard on my right hand, that I could pull my hand through the handcuff. I could get it out. By pretending he was still handcuffed, Tony was able to catch Gacy unawares when he returned and turn the situation to his advantage. I took the handcuff that I had gotten out of and I handcuffed him on one of his wrists and I reached into his pocket, got the key, and I handcuffed him behind his back, laying face down. He goes, you're the only one that not only got out of the handcuffs, you got them on me. And I didn't know what that meant. I thought that this was some type of test that he had performed before. And I let him stay handcuffed for 10 or 15 minutes before I let him out of the handcuffs. And, you know, he had previously agreed that when I let him up, he would leave. And he did. Tony had no idea just how close he'd come to being another victim of this deadly killer. On the 21st of December, 1978, they searched Gacy's home on West Somerdale Avenue for the second time. When they executed that search warrant, they went in the crawl space, and the very first shovel that they dug, they found human remains. Police had finally unearthed the secrets that Gacy had thought would stay buried forever. So they immediately called me, let me know that um, there was human remains in a crawl space, and at that time I arrested uh, John Gacy for murder. Gacy says he wants to confess, but really he wants to confess to the surveillance team, both myself and my partner and the other team. And now all of a sudden he's got an audience again, and he's on top of the world. And he knows he can't get out of it at this point, and so he might as well just divulge everything that actually happened. Gacy told detectives he was willing to draw a map of the burial site beneath his home. I gave him a pen and he started right off, he squared it off in the thing and he started, well, this was a double and this was a triple and this was the first guy with a, put an X on it. Went around the whole crawl space with these places where the body was buried. I mean, they were digging with spoons and everything, but they obviously identified where all the bodies were and they did an overlay of where the bodies were actually found compared to that diagram that he made. And it was unbelievable, it was right on the money. In total, 27 bodies were discovered in Gacy's crawl space. It wouldn't take long for news of this horrific discovery to filter out to the wider world. Then the arrest came down and that was the headline on the local papers, everything, how many bodies they took out of Gacy's basement. Well, you know, when Gacy's crimes were uncovered, he entered into the record books, you know, as the America's most prolific serial murderer. The notion that this, you know, pudgy, normal-seeming, decent, regular, ordinary guy was living in this horror house, you know, that was just suffused with 
the stench of death and that there were the rotting bodies of 27 young men in this crawl space, bringing home and torturing young boys right in the midst you know, of all his neighbors and then going off to work the next day. When we booked him for murder, we asked Gacy uh, where, where he was born. And Gacy looked at us and said, I was born in a state of confusion. And he smiled like that and we captured the photo. In total, Gacy confessed to the murder of 33 young men and boys between 1972 and 1978. Mick Philpott was born in 1956. He grew up in Derby as part of a large Roman Catholic family. It would have been an environment in which um, his parents' attention was diluted across many children, so he wouldn't have been the, the centre of attention by, by any means. And we know that his mother worked very hard. Um, she had a job at a, a factory that, that she only retired from when she was quite old. So he didn't appear to come from an unusual background by, by any means. In 1975, age 19, Philpott joined the army. He began to show signs of a violent temper, especially towards his girlfriends. It would repeatedly land him in trouble. Local journalist Martin Naylor recalls the events that led to Philpott being arrested in 1978. When Mick was a youngster, I think, 19 or 20, maybe 21, he ended up with a conviction for attempted murder, for which he was sentenced to seven years in prison. The story with that is that he had a girlfriend back in Derby. He was stationed wherever his regiment were. She'd had the temerity to send him a, a Dear John letter ending their relationship, so he decided to go away well from the army, rock up at her house in Derby, and attack her with a knife. And then when her mother tried to intervene, he, he attacked the mother too. Despite his seven-year sentence for attempted murder and grievous bodily harm, Philpott served just over three years. He was released in 1981. From that point onwards, Philpott set about controlling every woman he had any contact with, and to do so in the most outrageous way. Those who knew Philpott were surprised to hear just how violent his past had been. I know Mick can handle himself, so like, if anyone really was intimidating towards him, he wasn't afraid to pump his chest and stand up to him and, and so forth. So I know he had quite a strong like, reaction when, when people kind of pushed him. The bit that shocked me was um, I didn't know that he tried to kill his uh, ex-partner. After his release from prison, Philpott had a series of volatile relationships. In 1986, at the age of 30, he got married for the first time and fathered two sons and a daughter. He later had two more children with a teenage girlfriend and began to have several relationships simultaneously. By the time he was 50, Philpott had fathered a total of 17 children. This was a point at which Lisa had decided to take control, to take her children and to go to a women's refuge. And the key thing here is that Mick hadn't decided that that was OK. He was the one that decided when relationships were over. He was the one that decided what happened on a daily basis. So the fact that Lisa had betrayed him by taking that power away from him, it was only going to result in, in something really alarming in return. Lisa moving out left financial implications for Philpott. Not only did he lose her income as a cleaner, but also the benefits he received for their children. The custody hearing was set for May the 11th. Philpott concocted a plan to ensure that children would be returned to Victory Road. Out of the vanity and arrogance of the man, together with his wife, Maraid, and Paul Mosley, the kind of live-in, sometime lover, they hatch a scheme to set fire to the house in Victory Road in an effort to provoke the council to give him a bigger house, but also to blame his mistress. She will not get the custody of the children. It is an extraordinary, bizarre plan. I think Maraid was very much under Mick Philpott's control at this point in time. I think he would have um, quite easily have talked her around into actually being a part of this. It was a badly devised plan. 
to me, what convinced him is his own stupidity. He was self-absorbed. He thought that he was the king. You know, he could, he got all the girls he wanted and he could control them and everything. And maybe Philpott thought that he was that intelligent, that he, it was that easy to devise a plan that he could get back on the girl. So he probably sat down, wrote down the plan very quickly. This is what we're gonna do, right? Very easy. In the early hours of Friday, May the 11th, 2012, the same day as the scheduled custody hearing, Philpott, aided by his wife, Miraid, and their friend, Paul Mosley, poured petrol through the letterbox and set the family home alight. Six of Philpott's children were sleeping upstairs. The fire that he set, that they have set between them, takes hold at a pace far greater than they could possibly have conceived. And the house is literally filled with smoke in a matter of instants. In his typically vainglorious way, Philpott makes a particularly appalling 999 call, saying, my children are inside. There was on the phone to the emergency services, I believe, and they were saying that my house is on fire and it was like my baby, my baby, and obviously they, they told the emergency service, my neighbors, my neighbors here. It was very, like, misty, because everything's just happening so fast. I attempted to go into the house. I got as far as the kitchen, couldn't go any further. The smoke was just too thick. It was choking, black, couldn't see anything, so I had to come back out. There was a ladders at the side going up to a window. I tried climbing up to there, and there was a ratchet in the window where Mick's been trying to smash in, I think, and there was smoke coming from that window. I then came back down the ladders, and I climbed up onto a wooden frame what he's been built in onto his conservatory. The damage to the house is drastic, and there is no way that those poor six children could possibly have escaped. Smoke inhalation alone would have been deadly. I climbed up to the window, see if any windows were open. None of them were open. Then I put one of the windows through with a wrench from, from the other window. I chucked out the window, it smashed straight through. I then continued putting the window through with the, the pickaxe on the roof, smashing all the window up. I was about to climb into the property, Again, couldn't see nothing, couldn't hear nothing, and hear no screams. When the fire service arrived, the desperate attempts to save the children continued. The local press soon got wind of the unfolding drama on Victory Road. I was on the early shift on the morning of the fire, and I could hear that the news desk phone was ringing. So I made a bit of a dash for it. I grabbed the phone, and it was the on-duty police press officer. And she said to me, we're just letting the local media know early that there's been a really big house fire in Allenton and five kids are dead. Within about five or ten minutes of knowing that it was in Victory Road, I phoned the local news agent who I'd know because I'd done previous stories with him. He answered the phone and I said, Joe Gritz Martin from The Telegraph, and he said, it's Mick Philpott, it's Mick Philpott's house. And I didn't even have to ask him what it was about, he knew, and he'd blurted that out straight away. Shocked neighbours began to spill out onto the street as the full horror of the tragedy became apparent. I think nearly the whole street was out on the front. Uh, the fire brigade were in the house, flashing lights everywhere. I pushed to the front of the house and I could see the uh, firefighters bringing the children out. Um, some, some in blankets, I think they used the blankets to try and protect them a bit. A bit more. And the ambulance were trying to resuscitate some of them. I was just hoping that the kids would survive and recover. I was just, um, didn't really know what to think at the time. Didn't know what had happened, didn't know what caused the fire, just didn't know anything. Tragically, five of Philpott's children died at the scene. Ten-year-old Jade, nine-year-old John, eight-year-old Jack, six-year-old Jesse, and Jaden, who was just five years old. Their older brother, 13-year-old Duane, was rushed to hospital in a critical condition, but would later succumb to his injuries. One thing that they don't do throughout the entire press conference is appeal for help. Who set this fire? Who killed these children? Why? Because he knows he did it. 
It wasn't just the police who were suspicious. Philpott's performance had baffled the onlooking press too. At the end of it, I got in the car to drive back to the office and I thought, that's not right. Something's not right about that. He's not once mentioned the children. He's not mentioned them by name. He's not looked into any cameras and said, please, will someone out there help me find out who's done this? It's a suspicious fire in his own home and not once has he made an appeal to the public, to anyone who's watching, you know, please, anyone with information, come forward, not once. So then I got back to the office, and as I walked in, I could see everyone was still stood around the TV, and we all looked at each other, and that was the moment that we all knew, you know, you know something, something's wrong here. This is a game changer. Disingenuous would be a polite way of describing it. It is typical of a man who believes he alone rules the world. He is an emperor of everything he surveys. He is a man whose vanity knows no bounds, a man for whom he is the center of the universe, which in the end convinced the police that he wasn't telling the truth, that he seemed so capable of this kind of sleight of hand. He may have convinced himself, but he didn't convince many other people. I think he's such a narcissist, he's so arrogant, and, and he, he thinks he's gotten away with it, that, that he thinks he's invincible. He, he thinks that his act, as he's fooled many women over the years, is going to fool the rest of us, and it certainly didn't. The residents of Victory Road who'd rallied round the family also started to wonder what was going on. Her behaviour was strange. Uh, he did ask me if he, like, if he felt for the police. He said he thought the police was blaming him. He did say that to me. They, they think he did it and stuff like that. 88 officers working on the case had taken over 5,000 statements from local residents, some of which suggested that the police themselves had made more of an effort to save the six children than the Philpots. On May the 29th, 2012, 18 days after the fatal blaze, Mick Philpott and his wife, Miraid, were arrested on suspicion of murder. It was a new story that broke hearts across the nation. When the body of Sarah Payne was found on the 17th of July, 2000, it brought the search for the eight-year-old girl to a devastating end. She had been missing for over two weeks after being snatched from the street by a known paedophile called Roy Whiting. The search for the blonde schoolgirl had captivated the whole of Britain. Soft, gentle little girl. She hasn't got a horrible bone in her body. Somebody out there must have seen her. They must have seen her on that road. They must have seen her. Sky News anchorman Jeremy Thompson was just one of those following the story. The scale of the search was huge right across the country. Everybody was looking for Sarah Payne, hoping that they might help police to find her. In the end, of course, as so often happens in these sort of cases, the perpetrator was right under the police and nose, just a few miles away from where Sarah Payne had gone missing. It was a case that affected everyone involved, including lead detective Martin Underhill. That picture shows innocence. It also shows happiness. Those eyes, those beautiful eyes that are smiling at you, actually, they show completeness. And all that was taken away. And her photo will live forever. The murderer, 41-year-old Roy Whiting, had long been suspected as her killer, but it took over seven months to gather all the evidence needed to finally put him behind bars. He was a loser, he was a loner, and he'll always be remembered for the wrong reasons, which is he was a monster who killed a little girl. This killer's story begins almost 60 years ago. Whiting was born on January the 26th, 1959, in Horsham, in West Sussex. And he grew up in nearby Crawley. 
it was a family that was beset by quite a lot of tragedy. So there were six children and three of them died in infancy. So an awful lot of trauma to cope with quite early on in his life. Life for the young man didn't get any easier. Whiting's parents, George and Pamela, divorced when he was in his teens. Roy Whiting left school without any qualifications whatsoever. Um, he was somebody who didn't really get along in school. He wasn't particularly academic. Um, he didn't really fit in at all, whether socially or in, in terms of his studies. So he was always a bit of an outcast. Whiting was clearly a bit of an oddball, a loner. Friends described him as a bit of a Billy no mates. When you combine that with the insecure attachments he had within the family, that the lack of relationship with, with his mother, um, the, the disrupted relationship with his father, it does start to, to write a bit of a script. As he entered adulthood, Whiting found a passion for cars and he began working in a local garage. In 1986, he married a woman he'd met when she was working as an attendant at a petrol station. And they had a child together, but they separated and, and ended up getting divorced. By 1990, 31-year-old Whiting was living alone in his hometown of Crawley. It's pretty clear to me that Whiting developed an increasing interest in young girls, girls in their early years. And he, I'm sure, fought to some extent to control that obsession. Over a fortnight after the disappearance of eight-year-old Sarah Payne, the police were sure that a local man, Roy Whiting, was responsible for her abduction. But they had no solid evidence to prove it. As the search continued for the missing schoolgirl, breaking news on July the 17th, 2000, confirmed what everyone had been dreading. Then came that day that we'd all feared. I'm sure the whole country had feared. The police announced that they had found the body of what they believed was a child about. 30 feet away from a relatively main trunk road, the A29, partially covered just off a footpath. And I think we all held our breath collectively in news studios, in newsrooms, and around the country, and homes right across the nation, hoping that it wasn't the worst, but fearing that it probably was. The first thing I can confirm with you now is as a result of the post-mortem that was carried out in the early hours of this morning, this is now a murder inquiry. The second thing that you will obviously be wishing to anticipate is that we have been able to identify that the body in the field a half a mile from here is Sarah Payne's. That was um, a black day for the inquiry and a black day for the country, really, because everyone was still living in hope of a little girl coming home, and she didn't come home. She was found lying dead in the field, and she deserved better than that. Sarah had been found in a shallow grave on the edge of a farmer's field. Experts believe that the, the burial site where Sarah's body was found was dug by Roy Whiting very soon after he'd murdered her. So here is a sexual offender who wants to get this all over with very quickly. And it's almost as if he's, he's just closing that chapter, saying, right, that's done, I'm moving on. There's absolutely no sense of remorse, no sense of empathy with Sarah whatsoever. He's got what he wanted and he's finished. There was no forensic evidence on Sarah's body. So once again, the police were left frustrated. They had a receipt that proved that Roy Whiting was in the region at the time, but that was all. They needed some hard evidence, and a 999 call soon gave them that. The day that um, her body was found, that prompted the lady to pick up the phone and say, I should have told you before, but I saw a child shoe at the Coolum Crossroads, and that shoe transformed the case. This innocuous tip-off led police to the small hamlet of Coolum in West Sussex, just eight miles from where Sarah's body had been discovered. 
They were certain the shoe could help unlock the case, and about 150 metres from the road where it had first been spotted, they found it, discarded in a field. Whiting takes himself off, and of all unlikely things, goes to camp in a tent not all that far from the estate in Crawley where he abducted the girl in 1995. Feeling the pressure, Whiting's next move was a bizarre one. Whiting is clearly tormented. And during this period of the summer of 2000, he decides to steal a car. And then when the police went to stop him, he drove off at speed. Uh, and, in fact, drove down a road the wrong way and a high-speed chase ensued. Faster and faster, Whiting driving this rather tired Vauxhall as quickly as he can, eventually crashes it into another car. He's caught by the police who chased him and, of course, is charged with stealing the vehicle. This really is quite kind of out of control. It's, it's quite reckless. And it's because he's not thinking that far ahead. He hasn't actually considered the eventuality that he needs to get away. And when he does realise that that's a possibility, he does the, the most ludicrous things because he, he hasn't got a plan. On July the 23rd, 2000, Roy Whiting was arrested and charged with dangerous driving. He would have to remain in custody until his hearing. And that was an amazing moment for me because the risk level, the threat to the public disappeared. And we knew we had him. And all I had to do was keep that man in prison until we could prove he killed or abducted Sarah Payne. Whiting's time in custody would give detectives the chance to build a case against him. They knew that if they were going to arrest him for Sarah's murder, they had to get it right. Whilst he's in prison, police go back and re-examine his white Fiat van. Bear in mind, a white van had been seen in the lane where Sarah had gone missing. And they find in it, eventually, through very, very meticulous forensic testing, a blonde hair. The blonde hair was a 10 million to one shot that it had to be Sarah Payne. There was really very little forensic doubt. The blonde hair discovered on Whiting's sweatshirt was a huge breakthrough in the case, and more strong evidence was still to come from the forensic teams. We found fibres in that shoe which linked Whiting to the shoe and linked the shoe to Sarah. I think it was the icing on the cake for the case. It was the missing piece of the jigsaw, and then we, we had him and we had him big time. And slowly they were able to build a strong enough case against Roy Whiting to charge him with the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne. It felt good, actually. I just kept thinking, you can't do this anymore now. We're not gonna let you do this anymore because it's not okay what you did. And then the hard work started. We had to get the case to trial. On February the 6th, 2001, while serving 22 months for the car theft, Roy Whiting was arrested in his prison cell and charged with the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne, seven months after the disappearance of the schoolgirl. Sexual assault and murder of um, innocents, um, just we girls. Is, is particularly horrific. Black was finally arrested in 1990 after trying to snatch a young girl in broad daylight. He was eventually convicted of four child murders between 1981 and 1986. His youngest victim was only five years old. I think the impact of the Robert Black case on the community and on the nation was pretty devastating. This was the end of the idea of, of the innocence of childhood. After the Black case, I think parents started putting more restrictions on their children's freedom. Pat Cardi's nine-year-old daughter, Jennifer, was abducted and murdered by Black in 1981. 
but it would take several years before she knew who was responsible for killing her daughter. We still miss, miss her, particularly our two boys when she was taken. How hard, how difficult, how heavy it was upon them, not understanding anything, but just knowing that she would never be there again. That was brutal. Journalist Tim Tate investigated Black's life in the hope of discovering why he did what he did. They were terrible crimes. He probably killed more children than any other convicted child sex serial killer in Britain. This killer's story begins in 1947. Robert Black was born on the 21st of April in Grangemouth, about 20 miles from Edinburgh, Scotland. Robert Black's mother was unmarried at the time. There was a real stigma around illegitimacy, so he was given up. Now, his mother went on to get married and to have four other children, but she never, ever wanted anything to do with Robert Black. So right from the outset, this is, is somebody who's facing rejection and exclusion. He's somebody who has come into the world with a stigma on him. Black was fostered by Jack and Margaret Tulip, who lived in a remote Western Scottish village. They were in their mid-50s. They had no previous experience. They were strict, they were God-fearing, and he's never given their name. He's always Robert Black, something that would have marked him out at the time in that small community. Black later alleged that his foster parents were abusive towards him. The foster father died when he was five, but the foster mother uh, continued the abusive behavior that had been perpetrated beforehand. So he was beaten when he wet the bed. Here is somebody who does not have a, a safe or a secure home environment. This is uh, a young boy who has got no comfort from anybody whatsoever. From this disturbed upbringing, Black unsurprisingly rebelled and developed an unhealthy interest in other children. By the age of eight, he started offending. He's already developed sexualized behavior. He's taking the time and the trouble to peer up little girls' skirts. He has molested, that's putting it gently, a baby. And he's begun to explore bodily orifices. This is the obsession that will be with him all his life. In 1958, Black's foster mother died and he was sent to a children's home near Falkirk. His fascination with sex continued, and along with some other boys in the house, he tried to rape a 12-year-old girl. I think that act, if you like, was the genesis of Black's paedophilia. At some point, almost every pedophile who's attracted to a very young girl... ...was always on the lookout uh, for his next victim. And he had, in the back of his van, what can only be described as a, an abduction kit. He had bindings, he had um, this sack which he would put the child in. On the 30th of July, 1982, Black was on a delivery job in Northumberland, North East England, near to the village of Coldstream, where a young schoolgirl was leaving her house to go and play with her friends. Susan Maxwell is 11. She lives with her mum and her stepdad and their children in a little village. It's a happy, warm, loving home. It's a summer, it's afternoon. Susan says she wants to go and play tennis with her friend and it's agreed that Susan will walk home. The tragic, tragic irony is that she encounters none other than Robert Black and his van she had begun walking home, and at some point after 4.30, which is the last time anyone saw her, she was snatched, literally snatched, put in the black of Black's van and driven away. Susan's mother had changed her mind about letting Susan walk home and decided to pick her daughter up, but there was no sign of her anywhere, and she called the police. Tom Wood was the detective inspector at the Lothian and Borders Serious Crime Squad. 
We were sent down to the borders straight away to help with the investigation. And there were huge searches made uh, off the area because we thought that um, she might have been thrown over the bridge or fallen over the bridge or, or might have come to harm locally. On the 12th of August, a body was found near a village in a lay-by in the West Midlands, over 200 miles from where Susan had been abducted. It was the middle of the summer, and so the body was badly decomposed to the extent it was some time before we discovered that it was actually Susan. That made it impossible for the coroner to determine an exact cause of death. Susan was found partially clothed, indicating that she'd been sexually assaulted. The police were desperate to find the person responsible for such a heinous act. Most people are murdered by someone close to them. So we had to be very, very careful that we didn't go off in flights of fancy and that we did our homework first. Who was with her? When was she last seen? We then looked at local offenders. Were there any young men around who were committing sexual offences? And then we started on the big investigations looking for vehicles that were seen in the vicinity. And we got absolutely nowhere with it whatsoever. Well, Black avoided capture characteristics that was physical that had to do with his fixation. And that second criteria was that, that no adults had to be near that child or nearby responsible for taking care of that child. He would rehearse, he would drive round and round, even if he saw a child who he thought matched his image of an ideal victim. He wouldn't abduct straight away. He would monitor, he would look for escape routes. And only when everything was perfect would he pounce. For Robert Black, these girls were essentially disposable objects. He would abduct them in these blitz attacks off the streets. He'd abuse them, and then he would just discard them. He, he really was the, the most remorseless offender. Robert Black had now killed four young girls in just over four and a half years. His appetite for abducting, abusing and murdering young children would only intensify. The police had connected the murders of three of the young victims, but they were no closer to catching the killer. But a chance encounter would soon change everything. In July 1990, Black is still driving his van. And this time, he returns to the borders of Scotland, a little town called Stowe. A retired post office worker is mowing his lawn when he sees a van pull up. He also sees a young girl walk past the van. And then he sees the young girl lifted up and whisked into the van. With great presence of mind, this, this uh, guy noted the number of this van uh, accurately and immediately phoned the police. Uh, the police attended, and as they were standing, uh, discussing the issue on this little road in Stout, Black drives back down the same road where the same post office worker shouts, that's the van. And it is the same van, and it is Black driving it. A policeman stepped out, stopped the van, then detained the driver, um, and then searched the van, first found nothing, and then found the wee girl lying in the bottom of the van uh, in a bag, semi-suffocated. And the man who opens the back doors of the van is the little girl's father, who's a policeman. Can you imagine what impact that must have had on him? There can be no doubt that it was Black's overconfidence, his arrogance, to do something so outrageous in broad daylight in a tiny Scottish town and what's more then to drive back down the same road in which he's abducted. And thankfully, the little girl is still alive. She's been sexually assaulted, but she's escaped with her life. It's important to understand that a serial killer of the kind that Black was, he, he was a, an obsessed serial killer, not an incidental serial killer. He, he was destined to kill over and over and over again. Had he not have been caught that day, that girl would have died and many others would have died. Now, immediately Robert Black was arrested for that. Um, literally within the hour, 
we knew this was the man we were looking for because the, 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 the modus operandi was, was, so, was so identical. On the 10th of August 1990, Black pleaded guilty to the abduction and sexual abuse of the six-year-old girl in Stowe. He was given a life sentence and was sent to Salton Prison in Edinburgh.